Hi folks, so this week you're going to put together um, a rough sketch of your learning plan and we're going to use the, um, the um, Understanding by Design acronym WHERE TO. Um, please know that this is not a prescriptive um, acronym, it's considerations for the learning plan, okay? But it summarizes the elements that should be found in a learning plan. Um, given that what you have, um, have put in for your assessments and your essential questions, the, all the things that you've drafted in stage one and two. And please remember that this is very a very cursive process. So as you start to put together your learning plan, you may decide and go back and change something uh, from stages one and two. This is this is good practice. We don't just because we have it written down doesn't mean we stick with it. It means that we we're we're constantly rethinking and reflecting about the best ways to to help our students to learn. But I want to go over these pages with you and then let you have spend some time with them to help you think of what, what it may look like. So where to stands for, um, for, for these various components. So let me, let me just talk a bit about that. So let's talk about the W. Where, so this is where are we going, why, and what is expected. We have to think about the ways that we help our students understand why, why are we doing this and what do I want you to do. Um, this could be helping them to understand the standards, the learning goals. It could be um, helping them to think about um, the, the expected tasks they're supposed to do or the engagement in the, in the course. But there has to be some part of a where to, of the where, of the W in here, about the where, the why, and the what, so that students know what, what, what to do. Otherwise, they, you know, if we just ask students to do something, they, the, the first thing they say is, why, why, do we, why, do I, why am I doing this? So we do have to help them to understand the where, the why, and the what. The second piece is the H. This is so important. We have to be able to hook and hold their interest. Too often, you know, students, are, they, they're not interested in what we, we're asking them to do. We're not giving them a reason to do it, and these very much hook together because if you're giving a reason, then you've got to hook them with something that interests them. And I know that there's a, there's a big argument out there that our job is not that, to just make it, do things that are interesting to kids, that with it, they have to learn things no matter what. And I... Yes and no, you know, but if there are certain skills um, they need to learn or certain knowledge they need to retain, then we have to find a way of helping them to, to see why and um, helping them understand how it relates to their lived lives. So how will you hook and how will you hold student interest? And this just isn't at the beginning either. The introductory lesson, this is vitally important, but throughout your unit plan, there has to be some way of holding student interest. The E, how will we equip students for expected performances? This is about teaching. This is about support. This is about scaffolding. It may be direct teaching. It may be collaborative work. It may be group work. Um, it may be um, um, whatever. But this is, the, this is how we help students get to where we want them to be. And the R, how will we help them rethink and revise? Um, critical thinking is vitally important in any subject area. And so it's really important to help students to, to think about what, what, they, what, what ideas they come to this learning with what they're learning and how they can mesh that. And it may be that they need to rethink their positions. It may be that they don't rethink their positions, but they consider another position. So how will you help them rethink and revise? Okay. Um, the, the first E, I'm sorry, the second E is about self-evaluation and reflecting on their learning. This is the metacognitive piece. Um, so often students um, are asked to learn something and then we, we move on to something else without the chance to re reflect about why did I do this and what did I learn? And in a standards-based, um, proficiency-based learning, it's going to be so important for students to understand if they met a standard or not. You know, did they do enough? Did they show their, their proficiency in the standard? How will you help them to understand that and to self-evaluate? The T is the tailor, okay? This is differentiation um, for exceptional learners, for, um, for um, gifted and talented students, um, for, for whatever purposes we need to tailor learning to the various needs, interests, and styles. It might be looking at multiple intelligences. And then the O is, this is very much about the teacher work of organizing and sequencing the learning. Okay, so the scope and sequence of the work that you're going to do. Okay, so this is the broad, I, these are the broad ideas. These are considerations, okay, for your learning plan. It's not, you're not going to make a list of here are my W's, here are my H's, here are my E1's, here are my R's. Here are my, that's not what this is about. This is about a mindset of thinking about what, what goes into a, a, an effective um, learning experience. All right, the following pages give you some 
questions to consider for each one of the acronym letters, and then some examples. And I'm not going to go through each one of these, but I want to just briefly look at the W here just so you understand. So um, in the W, you know, this is this is where the, where the key, the, um, I'm sorry, um, the acronym where to summarizes the key elements that should be, I'm sorry, I'm on the wrong page. It's a Sunday morning at my house and I'm trying to get things done. Okay. So the where to should be, the W and the where to should be considered from the student's perspectives, okay? So this is where you have to be clear about your goals and the evidence needed to show the extent the students have achieved them, all right? So here are four considerations. What are the goals? What are the expectations? What's the relevance and value? And how do you know if students are getting there? From, from where are students coming? What prior knowledge? What mis misperceptions would they have? You know, so why is this worth learning? This is very much about the students and helping them to understand what you're asking them to do, why you're asking them to do it, and then also knowing how you're going to know that, that they're, they're achieving these goals. So here are some examples, okay, that you could, and they should happen throughout your unit, not just at the beginning. So for your goals, it might be that you directly state the desired results. It might be that you give them a syllabus um, or a schedule. It might be that you put the essential questions um, on the board at the beginning of the unit. It might be that you invite students to generate questions. Um, so, so goals can be established in many different ways. And even though you're establishing goals in your unit plan, that doesn't mean that you can't invite students to help augment those goals or kind of help them to th see why your goals are important. Expectations. Um, you know, let them know what, what you're asking ask them to do. This, this should not be an ambush thing. This should be, they should know from the beginning what you're going to ask them to do. They should know how you're going to score them with rubrics. We're going to talk about rubrics in, in a few weeks. Um, you might, you want to show models and exam, exemplars for expected products and performances. Just as I'm showing you, um, you know, a model for um, a unit plan using understanding by design and backward design, you have to think about providing your students with models as well for your expected uh, performances. Not necessarily a um, something that you create, it might be something that a, a former student used that you get permission to use, whatever, but, but help them to understand what you want. If they don't know what the target is, it's hard for them to get there. You know, involve them in identifying preliminary evaluation criteria. The more you involve students in their own evaluation, the better off the students and you will be. Um, relevance and value, help them understand the rationale, discuss the benefits, um, identify the people and places beyond the classroom where this knowledge is, is applied. How many times do we have hear students say, why do I have to learn this stuff? And if we just say because I said so or because it's a standard, that's not good enough for kids. They want to know, you know, why do I have to learn this stuff, you know, and, and help them to know how they're going to use this. Um, in your discussions already, I've heard, heard about, you know, being, making things relevant for kids and, and using their, their, what they're doing in their lives to help them to know why this is important, how they can apply it. Um, the KWL chart is a great chart, and, and this week I've given you a whole bunch of activities, and I, I invite you to look at those. KWL is one way of helping students to identify the things they want to learn, not just what, what you want them to learn. And then diagnosis, you know, how are you going to know where they are and where they're going and how, if they've gotten there? So you might give a pretest, you might give a diagnostic skill test, you might use the KWL again, um, you might have them create a visual organizer, you might just do, do a, you know, an observation check. So lots of ways for these examples here. The H, again, hooking and holding students. You know, how, what, what is it you're going to do to hook them? So in my, in my lesson plan that I'm going to present to you in a little bit, um, this is kind of what I, I feel mine does. I think it makes an emotional connection. I think it also connects to personal experience. And I think it also looks at a, on an issue, okay? Now, again, this is, I'm looking at a literature um, uh, unit, but there's also some, some real-life um, applications to it as well. But you might have something different, you know, maybe you've got a challenge, maybe a mystery, but some way of hooking and holding students introduced early on. And for me, it's the, you know, I, I use the inquiry question that helps students to kind of keep them going, you know, the provocative entry question, you know, who is a hero? Who, who makes a hero? So these are things that help students to stay engaged with the topic. Okay, so here again are some um, some other ideas to think about um, in terms of equipping students, okay? 
So this is, can be direct instruction, all right? So there's nothing wrong with direct instruction as long as it's mixed up with other things, but then some things have to be taught explicitly to help students to, to get where you want them to get. It might be experiential or inductive learning. So here we have direct instruction, which is kind of traditional, but it's fine, it works, but it's as long as it's not the only tool in the kit. Experiential or inductive learning, um, you know, where um, you help students to explore the big ideas and questions. I do this very much so in my hero unit where I invite students to really explore the, the topic and, and to come up with some, some ideas and positions about that. Um, so experiential or inductive learning. And then homework and other out-of-class experiences, okay? So, so, so continuing the work as homework, um, as long as it's not, um, you know, overwhelming, is not a bad thing for students. Or maybe they're doing some out-of-class experiences where they might be doing some research or investigating or, or doing some interviewing, okay? So here are th just there's three different ways, okay? Um, you might think about the six facets of learning, okay, in terms of, of how this might, um, might help you, okay? And we talked about that briefly last week in a PowerPoint. So the six facets of learning are explanation, interpretation, application, perspective, empathy, self-knowledge. And these all relate to Bloom's taxonomy, which is another um, piece of this week's work in terms of thinking about the cognitive uh, ladder um, of, of ability and skills. All right. So we have to think about those things as well. And, and, and those six facets of learning very much tie into that. And, and where do you ask them to do those things and how do you ask them to do them? Remember, in equipping students to learn, they have to be able to do you know, the lower cognitive, the lots, before they can do the hots. So if we ask them to immediately start to, um, to analyze something without them first understanding it, knowing it, and being able to recall it, uh, or even being able to apply it, we might be in a little bit of trouble. So do think about the developmental um, stages of learning. And do think about the ways in which you structure your unit plan so that students are not um, being um, asked to do something that they're not cognitively ready to do. All right, so here's some examples of, of uh, equipping students. And I'm not going to read through all of these. But again, I'm going to ask you to remember to scaffold with Bloom's Ladder. I'm going to ask you to remember the six facets of, of learning so that if you're going to ask students to, to, to write a paper, for instance, um, in any subject, then there has to be some scaffolding, there has to be some, some ability um, to be able to do that before you just assign it. So remember, assist rather than assign. Um, assign comes after assist. Um, here's another piece uh, for uh, equipping students for performance um, task. I'm not going to go over this one. You can look at it on your own. It's, it's, it's pretty good. It's pretty important, but you have to also think about what you have to do to get... Just let me say one thing about this. So. Um, you know, if you're asking students to give a speech, just telling them to come and give a speech, um, you may be disappointed. But helping them to understand the elements of a good speech before they do it is going to make the performance so much better. Okay, so here we go with the R. This is the rethink, revise, reflect piece of this. Um, so, again, rethinking the big ideas. Keep coming back to those essential questions. You know, how will you design challenges for them to keep revisiting that? Um, too many times we have these essential questions and then we forget about them. We just kind of march through the, the unit plan and with it to the end and like, oh wait, we need to go back to these questions. Try to keep those, keep those, you know, again, keep working those in, you know, so that students are constantly looking at that. The point of having the essential questions is that they have these big questions to sort of grapple with as they're learning new ideas and new skills. Um, revise and refine, you know, what skills do they need to practice, what needs they rehearse. Um, you know, how might their products or performances be improved? This is, this is very important, and particularly, um, I, I, I absolutely believe in peer review, and I, 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 I ask you to consider thinking about including that in your unit plan somewhere, um, you know, on a regular basis, where students are reviewing one another's work and offering feedback and support. If, if the, their work is only to, uh, only the, if the only audience for their work is the teacher, they're just gonna they're gonna write or write or work or do perform or calculate for you rather than thinking about, you know, the greater audience. You know, and I realize that schools are these insular places, but if we broaden the audience to their peers and then eventually broaden it to the to a greater community, um, it makes so much more sense for kids. And then reflecting again, you know, how will you ask them to reflect upon their learning? You know, how will they? You, what will you do to help them become more metacognitive of knowing how they know something? Um, here again are some examples, and I'm not going to go over all of these, but um, you can you can look at them yourself. In my own unit plan, I th I, I think that you know through discussion, you know I'm asking students to rethink, 
um, and through revise and, re and refine, they're doing some writing and I'm incorporating peer review there. And I'm reflecting, I'm asking students to keep journals and a self-assessment, okay? So um, those are ways in which in my unit plan that I'm, I'm giving you as a model, and it's not perfect by any means, believe me. And if I spent more time with it, I would do a lot more revising. But you'll get the point. But anyway, those are the things that I feel that I'm doing to address this rethink, revise, and reflect. Um, here's, here's, this is kind of a nice thing. Um, again, these could be used as prompts to guide students to self-evaluation and reflection. It doesn't necessarily have to be at the end of the unit, although in my unit that's where it ends, ends up. But it could be throughout the unit, um, as this could be ways of you, uh, sort of a formative assessment, a check-in to see how students are doing. And then tailoring um, the work. Again, this is a differentiation. Um, so, you know, at the beginning, you know, assessing prior knowledge and skills so that you know what you, you know, at the beginning, and then developing differentiated activities to accommodate these different knowledges and skill levels. Um, providing students with open-ended questions, activities, assignments, and assessments um, that enable students to give different, different, okay, but equally valid responses. Um, appealing to various modalities, in other words, presenting information orally, visually, and in writing. And now we have to be careful here because if the standard isn't, you know, for a writing standard, then presenting it visually and orally will not meet that standard. But there are many other um, standards that, in which students can um, present their information in multiple modalities. Um, use a variety of resource materials. This is so important. So many times we get stuck with the textbook. And so think about you know, the different materials that you could give students that would help them to unpack a difficult concept or that would help scaffold them to greater understanding. Um, process, um, again, there should be a mix. It shouldn't just be all one thing. Students should work alone sometimes, but they also should have the opportunity to work in groups, in pairs, um, so that there's different ways of, of, their, of, of, of doing this work, but it's also accommodating different learning styles. Remember, you know, I, I, if I do a, a multiple intelligences, it's going to tell me I'm intrapersonal, which means I, I like my own company the best. You know, I work, I work best by myself. But that doesn't mean I can't work with other people. I can, and I do it quite well. It's just not my preferred modality. So we have to help students to get out of their own little sort of world. You know, if they say, well, I'd rather work alone. Well, that's fine for sometimes, but sometimes it's good to work with people as well. And some people want to work with groups all the time. Well, that's good, but sometimes it's good to do your own individual work. So we have to think about helping students to be comfortable in, in multiple ways of working. Um, encourage students to develop their own research questions for in-depth exploration. Um, I, I, I absolutely believe in this. You know, if, if you're asking students to do research of any kind in any subject area, if, you, if they're developing the questions, it makes it so much more meaningful for them. With guidance. I mean, we have to guide them, of course. And then allow students choice of products. Well, we talked about this before. Um, so visual, written, oral, and then the various um, products and performances. So think about the tailoring, okay? Um, in the differentiation unit for this class, you're going to create a tiered assignment, which will be differentiation of, could be differentiation of content, process, or product. We'll talk about that when we get there. And the organizing. This isn't something that the students see. This is something the teacher sees. This is how you put up this, you, you create the scope and sequence of this learning. And you need to think of, of two different kinds of, of dynamics here, all right? Coverage, okay? So here's, this is the, this is, this is sort of the traditional model where you have a textbook and you kind of go, you know, step by step. So the teacher is the tour guide, just walking you through this. Um, and you, you move from facts and basic skills to more advanced concepts and processes, um, exposes students to a breadth of material, um, uses hands-on and experiential um, activities. It tests, teaches and tests the discrete pieces before having students apply them. So this is the coverage where this sort of, we, we, we start with the, the parts, and we keep adding parts and parts and parts and we, until we get to what we hope makes a whole. Sometimes this works, sometimes it doesn't. Okay, sometimes students never get to the whole. They only see the pieces and then they forget the pieces and don't know how they connect together. Um, history, for me, history was like that when I was going to school. I love history. You know, I, I, could, I, I could be a history teacher because I have plenty of history courses, but I cho chose not to, but I could. I mean, I, I do believe that. Um, but the, I, the idea of looking at a holistic thing rather than you know the individual discrete pieces of and then trying to put it all together made no sense to me 
the second organizational pattern makes more sense to me. And it doesn't always work for everything. Please let me, let me say that. I'm not advocating the uncoverage model will work for everything. For some things, the coverage model will work. But if that's the only, if it's a steady diet of coverage model for a particular discipline, you may lose some students. Um, they they don't, just don't want to do the work for you. But if you mix it up, you know, with some, there are some discrete things you need to learn. But now let's look at the whole part. So the logic of uncoverage is that there's just this unfolding story or problem that we have to have to solve. A any discipline, there can be an, un an unfolding story or problem to solve. You begin with a hook and you teach uh, on an as needs and needed basis. Um, you don't give them everything they need to get started, okay? That's overwhelming. You give them pieces, and you just, you, that's the scaffolding part, okay? You make the sequence more surprising and less predictable, um, you know, so that, that students aren't seeing, like, okay, we're going to do this and this and this and this, so that there's some mix up there, that, that there's, you know, somewhat of a surprise there. Um, we ensure that there are ongoing cycles of model, practice, feedback, and adjustment. This is really important, model, practice, feedback, and adjustment. I'd, I'd underline those words. Let me just do that right now, okay? Very important. Uh, focus on transferable big ideas, okay? It doesn't mean that we don't want them to, to know certain discrete pieces of information, but if we focus on the big ideas, the little, the little pieces will, will fill in, and students are apt to remember those so much more. And then move back and forth between the whole and the parts, rather than teaching all the little bits first out of context. So think about sports, arts, vocational technical projects, um, you know, if, if one had to learn every single discrete rule of football before you were able to put on a football helmet and go play, not many people would play football, okay? So, so think about in terms of the ways in which you learn how to do things. Do you need to know every, every single piece of it before you engage in an activity? Or do you learn what you need to know to begin to work, and then you practice it, and you go back and you, you look and see what you did wrong, um, you, and so forth. This is very much Vygotsky's zone of proximal development. And I'm sure all of you have heard about Vygotsky in his own proximal development. Thank you.